Thank you everyone for joining us for Crabs, Habs, Sharks, and more. My name is Ivy Fernuka, and I am the Casco Bay Keeper with Friends of Casco Bay. My colleague, Mike Doan, our staff scientist, will be moderating today's panel with me. If you are not familiar with Friends of Casco Bay, if this is your first time with us, we have worked for over 30 years to improve and protect the environmental health of Casco Bay, and we plan to fulfill that mission for a long time to come. And to help us do our work, I mean, Matt, um, Mike is our lead scientist and I am the lead advocate for the Bay, but to help us do our work, we often talk with other researchers and commercial fishermen and oyster farmers and many others who depend upon Casco Bay. And through those conversations, we all, learn to better understand the health of Casco Bay, how it's changing, and actions we might take to make the Bay resilient and healthy in the future. So today's panelists are some of the many people that we talk with, and like us, their research is designed to understand a change in the Bay or to solve a problem. Um, for example, why are softshell clam populations in Casco Bay declining precipitously? Or are shark populations changing in the Bay? And uh, unfortunately, one of our panelists, Matt Craig, is unable to join us today due to illness, but his efforts to help our salt marshes be resilient to sea level rise and increased storm surge is really important because salt marshes are such a critical habitat and way to make coastal Casco Bay um, resilient to the impacts of increased storm intensities. So we'll invite Matt to talk another time. Um, so now for some housekeeping. First off, for whatever reason, even though we've all been in the Zoom world for a while, this has been a really weird week Zoom-wise. So please put up with us. Some of our panelists are now in locations with less than desirable internet. Um, sometimes we might forget to unmute ourselves, just please, please, we're in a very human space with all of this. Um, so um, please, please bear with us. And because there's so many of you registered for this event, there's over 200 people registered and over 100 people already logged in. You won't be on camera and you will be muted the entire time, but your questions are really important to us and are the biggest part of why we put this panel together. So during the presentations, please enter your questions in chat. Mike will be collecting those questions and he will moderate a question and answer session with our panelists later in the program. So to use chat, if you're on a computer, you can see down along the bottom of the screen where it says chat. And if you're on an iPad or a mobile device, tap on the screen to make sure you get the bar that's there. Go to participants and under participants, you'll see the the chat feature. And for all of you, if you would please select um, all attendees and panelists, that way everyone can see the questions, uh, that would be really helpful. So to test that and see how technology is working, would you all please use your chat feature to answer the questions, have you seen green crabs in Casco Bay? And if so, where? Robbie just put that question in chat. And Mike, while, um, while our guests are answering that question, as our staff scientist, what are you most looking forward to regarding today's program? Boy, um, for me, I think it's really just having the opportunity to hear from some of our colleagues. Um, I know that um, you know here at Friends of Casco Bay, we, we do a lot of work on a lot of things, but there are a lot of issues out there, a lot of concerns that we have um, that we're just not focusing on. And it's great to hear from those who are working um, directly on some of these things that we're concerned about. So um, I'm excited for this. Um, I know Ivy, you and I have been talking about getting a panel together like this for a while now, and it's great to finally have one here. And hopefully it's just the first of, of many, but um, I won't Thanks, hold you up anymore. Yeah, let's just yeah. get some questions yeah. and begin. So uh, the reason we asked you about green crabs and I've been watching where people have been um, putting in the information about their viewings is that our very first panelist will discuss green crab research. And Sarah, would you please put up our first poll question for our guests? 
And while you all are answering this poll question, trying to uh, guess or tell us if you know uh, what the meaning of the name for green crab translates to, I will introduce our panelists. So our first guest is Dr. Marissa McMahon, and she is the Director of Fisheries at Manomet. And Marissa's research informs actions that might be taken to protect our wild fisheries. And she oversees uh, green crab research that monitors populations of crabs at diverse locations and explores development of markets to reduce those populations. So Marissa's presentation will explain why the invasive green crabs are a problem and she will focus on her monitoring of the populations in Casco Bay. But you might want to ask her about the commercial markets she is working to develop in your questions as well. So um, I'd like to invite um, Marissa to come on screen and Sarah to share with us the answers that people gave to the poll question. Ooh, Ah, uh, Marissa, would you please tell us what the correct answer is to this poll and then share your presentation? Absolutely. I'm going to say hi to everyone with my video on now, but I will turn it off. I'm one of the panelists that's struggling a little bit with internet bandwidth. Um, but the correct answer is actually the raving mad crab, which is one of my personal favorite facts about green crabs. Um, the, the root of the word manus is from manid, which is uh, goes back to Greek mythology, the followers of the god Dionysus, who's the god of wine. And so the Latin noun actually translates to frenzied or raging, which if you have ever seen green crabs, which it seems like a lot of folks have from the chat, uh, you will know that that is actually a fairly good description of this species. Um, so with that, I'm just gonna stop my video and share my screen. Here we go. Okay. All right, so um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the uh, trends that we're finding in green crab populations where we're monitoring. We've established some long-term monitoring sites. I'm not going to talk a ton about the history of the green crab invasion or their devastating environmental impacts, which are many, but I'm happy to answer questions about that later. Um, instead, I really just want to focus on these monitoring efforts. And so I'm going to start with just a map to orient viewers to our long-term monitoring sites. So these are our three original sites, Sandy Point in Yarmouth, uh, the New Meadows River, and Robin Hood Cove in Georgetown, which is up there in purple. Um, and we're adding sites all the time. So we actually have two new sites in Phippsburg as of last year. And we also have some sites in the Damariscotta River that folks at the Darling Marine Center are monitoring. But today I'm going to focus mostly just on these three sites. Uh, the monitoring method is pretty straightforward. We target the low intertidal area of rocky shorelines, and we use a meter square quadrat as a unit of measurement. And we sample 10 of these quadrats at each site every month from April or May through November. And we collect all the crabs and find, that we find and take several measurements, including size, sex, shell color, or shell condition rather, and color. And I actually saw Diane Cowan's name in the chat earlier, and I want to give a shout out to her because a lot of these methods are actually adapted from her juvenile lobster monitoring protocol um, that the Lobster Conservancy has been doing for many years. So uh, jumping right into results, though, I first just want to point out some really clear differences that we see in populations among sites. So this figure is looking at density and looking at the average number of green crabs per meter squared at our New Meadow site, Robin Hood site, and Sandy Point site from May through November. And one of the first things that really jumps out here is just that the, uh, you know, the, the, the density differs among sites. Um, we see that the New Meadows tends to have higher densities of green crabs than the other sites, although primarily in the summer and fall. And then another interesting trend we see is that the Robin Hood and Sandy Point sites have the highest density in the spring and then it tapers off. So we can start trying to interpret what's going on here by also learning something about the local environment. So the New Meadows is a, you know, quite a bit warmer than these other sites. The Sandy Point site is much more exposed to wave action. Um, so some of these site differences might be leading to the, the differences in the populations that we're seeing. 
And then looking at other monitoring programs like the Friends of Casco Bay and the Down East Institute, who you'll hear from next, is really important as we start trying to interpret these results. I'm gonna quickly breeze through the next two figures just for the sake of time, but I did just wanna point out that um, we do see pretty big differences in the ratio of male to female crabs at these sites. So this figure is showing the percent of crab sampled that were male. So you can see that this differs quite a bit among sites, but also within sites over time. And then similarly, and somewhat linked to the differences in sex, we also see differences in size among sites. So this figure is showing the frequency of different size classes of green crabs. So we see that there tends to be smaller crabs in the new meadows and larger crabs at Sandy Point. Um, and then we can look more closely at what happens over time within a site. So this is density at the New Meadows site from 2018 to 2021. 2021 was a record-breaking year for green crab abundance at all of our sites, but none quite so much as this site. So those black bars are the 2021 densities, and we were seeing averages of eight or nine green crabs per meter squared in many of these months. Um, and that's just the average. Some of our higher counts, we had upwards of 20 crabs per meter squared. So if, if you can picture a meter square, that's not really that big of an area. So these densities are really just unbelievable. Um, and it likely has something to do with the overwintering success of the crab. So mild winters like we had from 2020 to 2021 tend to favor greater survival and abundance of green crabs. But ultimately, these sorts of findings really emphasize how important this type of monitoring is for informing what's changing in these populations and then also informing how we react. So to that end, I just want to quickly finish with some data that directly informs fishery development, and that is the presence of soft shell crabs. So when and where are crabs molting? That soft shell phase is when they are highly valuable with culinary markets. Um, and, and we're seeing that fishers are actually getting upwards of $30 a pound for the soft shell crab product. So what we're seeing here in the intertidal is that there is a peak in male molting in May and June, and then a peak in female molting in August and October. So really useful information for people that are looking for those lucrative soft shell crabs. So with that, I just want to wrap up by saying there's loads of ways that this type of monitoring data can be applied, a few of which are listed here, including uh, green crab fishery development and shellfish management as well. Um, and then I'll also just point out quickly that we're in the process of making this data open access so that anyone can utilize these findings. So thanks for watching this uh, quick overview and please visit our website to learn more about these efforts if you're interested. Thanks, Marissa. I saw a lot of good um, questions coming in in the chat, so people will be eager to speak with you. Um, Sarah, would you please post our next poll question? So while you all are contemplating what is the primary cause of soft shell or steamers, as we all think of them, clam decline in Casco Bay, I'll introduce our next speaker, Sarah Randall. And Sarah's the Associate Director at Down East Institute. And for a decade, she has been monitoring softshell clam populations in Casco Bay and other locations along the coast of Maine. So our beloved steamers are a true indicator of the health of our intertidal zone and changing conditions. Um, Sarah's research is done with clamors and strives to preserve this dwindling but important commercial fishery. And the primary focus of her research and, and uh, the Down East In Institute's research is what is causing the precipitous decline of softshell clam populations and how might that be addressed? So Sarah, I'd like to invite you to come on screen, please. And I know you may not be able to stay on screen, um, but would you, um, let's see, Sarah, please post the poll result, results. And Sarah, um, let me ask you how our guests did with answering this question, what the, what the correct answer is, and then please go on to your presentation. I think they, they got it. Um, 30, uh, the increased predation spurred by warming uh, water temps is the primary cause of the soft shell clam decline. 
And I am also one of, thank you for that introduction, Ivy. And I am also, I'm actually um, thwarted a little bit in my location today. So I'm up near the Canadian border and hopefully my internet um, holds up, but I'm really excited to be here today. And um, as Ivy said, I'm uh, doing shellfish research in Casco Bay. And I started doing this uh, around the time of the ocean heat wave um, in 2012, uh, if people remember uh, that time period. That's when it became really apparent that the, um, you know, the decline of the clams and then also the appearance of more and more green crabs. And I started trying to investigate the cause of that and ways to enhance the clam harvest. And I primarily, you know, look at soft shell clams and quahogs, which are increasing as in importance. And, um, you know, the commercial fishery for clams is one of the iconic fisheries of Maine, and it's very important in terms of the number of fishermen it employs, the amount of landings, and um, the value. And my research really concerns the um, looking at baby clams, at, they're called um, recruits. So these are the clams that settle onto the mudflats um, in you know, the early spring, and I want to figure out what has happened to them. Have we know there's a high levels of predation. So I want to figure out how many of those clams that settle or recruit to the mudflats are surviving their first year of life because they're very vulnerable when they're this small to predation, to OA, to, to other factors. So how many um, of those are surviving? Because of course, commercial clam harvests do depend on those animals surviving till their next year of life. And in Casco Bay, you know, we can reach harvestable size of clams in two years. So in 2014, I started doing different um, field research, primarily in or in Freeport, which is in Casco Bay. And I wanted to look at, again, like ways to um, make sure that the clam recruits are growing and surviving. And I, with a certain set of experiments I did, I looked at sediment buffering, which means spreading shells or other forms of calcium carbonate onto the mudflats to remediate the impacts of local acidification. The idea is if ocean acidification is causing the clams to, to perish, then spreading shells will give them a better environment that they can live in um, and, uh, sur and survive. So over the course of the three years, I did eight independent field experiments in these locations in Freeport. And we also designed the experiments so that we could disentangle the results of um, or the, the effects of predation versus um, spreading shell hash. And in all those eight experiments in those three years, we did not find any beneficial um, use from spreading the shell hash. The only way we found enhancement of clams and clam recruits are from the um, protecting them from predators. And if people are interested in that, it was published in 2020 in the Journal of Experimental Marine Biology and Ecology. But, um, it's very important to um, do repeated field experiments and building on what you've learned in previous years. And last year, that's exactly what we did at another location in Casco Bay with um, a variety of partners. So last year, we did a oyster shell hash study because we wanted to learn if applying oyster shells um, in higher densities would in fact help um, increase um, clam survival. And we worked with partners such as the Maine DMR Coastal Program, Casco Bay Estuary Partnership, the EPA, MIT Sea Grant, of course, Friends of Casco Bay. And in 2019, those groups had collected oyster shells from Portland area restaurants. And they had done a shell recycling program. And then they had stored those shells, cured them. And then in 2020, asked the Institute to devise an experiment to understand if there was some more beneficial use to applying those to the natural marine environment. And one of the key things that we did um, was to, in devising the 2020 experiment was to, or 2021 experiment was to increase the density of the shells that we applied onto the mud flats. Um, and it, our exact experiment were that we, uh, was that we crushed over 700 pounds of oyster shells and we crushed them into different sizes. And there's a picture up here, hopefully that you can see of the different sizes that we crushed the shell into 
you know, small, medium, and large, four millimeters to uh, 9.4 millimeters on average of these sizes. And then our densities were, lar were heavier than what we used in 2014, 15, and 16 in our Freeport experiments. So we, our densities, we had densities of 2.8 pounds a meter, 4.3 pounds a meter, and uh, 5.6 pounds a meter there. And then we t and we also had controls. And then we all so then we doubled those treatments. And on the second half of them, we protected them from predators so by putting predator deterrent netting on that them. And that's another so that's a way that we can disentangle the effects of predation versus shell hash. And in that field schematic. Um, those black boxes are what we call recruitment boxes. And those are ways that we measure how many recruits um, are settling onto the mud flats and we, because those boxes create a predator protected environment. And so we'll use those um, numbers of the clams that, and, and cohogs that settled into those to help interpret our, our, our results because we also sampled within the um, the plots to see, and we'll 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 sort of we'll, we will compare the amounts of uh, recruits that came to the flats versus how many are found in each of those treatments. And we deployed this experiment before the clam started spawning, and in Casco Bay or everywhere, it's dependent on water temperature. And in Casco Bay, you're pretty safe if you deploy it before you know by the beginning of May. Um, you know, end of April. So that's what we did. And we kept the experiment in throughout the whole period of the clam growing season. And in addition to um, sampling the uh, mud flats at the end of the year with the recruitment boxes and the benthic core samples within the uh, plots, we also assessed the carbonate chemistry of the mud flats. So we wanted to know what happened to the carbonate chemistry from the application of the shell. And we devised a way to look at that, the, that whole system. So we are looking at pH, total alkalinity, partial pressure of carbon dioxide, dissolved inorganic carbon, and aragonite saturation state. And we sampled them before um, we applied the shell, 24 hours after, one month later. And then we also did it at the end of the clam growing season, which is November, when we took out the experiments and sampled everything. And so unfortunately, um, the final results are not known. I'm literally up, uh, usually in Machias these past two weeks, um, looking, uh, counting and measuring all the clams that we have found um, to determine the results. And I have not finished that process and the analysis is not finished as of yet. But as a reminder that um, once we get this done, we are going to learn if the application of oyster shell hash in these higher densities than what we'd previously done increases clam recruitment and survival. And we'll also know more about the effects of applying shell hash on mudflat carbonate chemistry. And because I'm here today, I just wanted to mention another project that is underway in uh, Casco Bay, and it's actually underway across the whole state of Maine. It's called the Clam Recruitment Monitoring Network. And in each of these locations, I have two, um, these are all different towns. In Casco Bay, we have sites in Brunswick, Scarborough, and this year we'll add Phippsburg. And um, in each of those towns, we have two intertidal um, monitoring locations where we are determining using those recruitment boxes I measured, uh, I mentioned before, the, um, the species, the commercial species that are recruiting to the mudflats, um, their numbers, how many, um, or what their growth rates are, how many green crabs are there. And um, with our sampling method, we can determine how many of those recruits are surviving their first year of life. And um, that is a critical for predicting future harvests. And so that is my quick overview and um, I'll welcome any questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Just to clarify two things before we move on to our next panelist. I saw a number of questions about um, predators. And were you netting for green crabs and milky ribbon worms? Or when you say predator, were you primarily focused on uh, green crabs? Right. Yes. So that's a great, great question. And the netting primarily protects from green crabs. OK, thank you. Um, 
And I'm sure there'll be lots of other questions later, but thank you so much, Sarah. And I hope that you'll share your results with us so we can send them out to everyone who, like me, is probably feeling like, oh, I really want to know the results. Um, so thank you. Um, would you please take down your screen share? And Sarah, would you please share our next poll question? So you've heard our title is crabs, habs, sharks, and more. Hab stands for harmful algal blooms, and you're going to learn more about those now. Here is your poll question to answer while I introduce our next speaker. So Bryant Lewis works with the Department of Marine Resources, and he is the growing area supervisor for Western Maine. And what that basically means is um, southern, the southern part of the state, if you think of the coast as the eastern coast and the western coast. And um, Bryant is part of a really important program that constantly monitors the water to ensure that people don't consume shellfish that has ingested a phytoplankton bloom known as a HAB or harmful algal bloom that can make us sick or even um, kill us. And they do an excellent job. You never hear, <laughs> never hear about this happening in Maine because DMR does such a great job with this program. So Bryant did a training for our water reporters in the spring of 2021, but last summer was a really odd year to track HABs. And it was a real puzzle to us. And Bryant, we look forward to your presentation and wonder if you would please come on screen and tell us the correct question to this poll and begin your presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, most people got the answer right. The answer is indeed false. Um, harmful algal blooms do not always produce a visible water discoloration that people could use as a warning to decide for themselves whether or not to eat the shellfish. Uh, in fact, the time I've been at the MR, I've never seen water discoloration due to a, a harmful algal bloom, even in years when we knew the shellfish were toxin, but we've seen plenty of water discolorations every year that are from uh, harmless algal blooms. So that is not a good indicator. Uh, it's a very poor indicator um, to, for, for a person to use themselves to decide if shellfish are safe to eat. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk for a few minutes about the lack of HABs in Casco Bay in 2021, and therefore the, the relatively minor amount of closures, shellfish closures that occurred uh, compared to other years. Give a little bit of information about what it is that can cause these algal, uh, harmful algal blooms to, to happen some years and uh, be very minor in other years, like 2021. So very briefly, HAB stands for harmful algal blooms. Uh, the al algae we're speaking about are phytoplankton, so those are effectively free-floating uh, or swimming plants, microscopic plants, that are in the water that are consumed by shellfish and then eaten by us. But a few of those genuses of algae or phytoplankton produce toxins. And um, when shellfish eat a lot of these algae, it accumulates within the shellfish. And for the most part, has little or no impact on the shellfish themselves. You can't even use the shellfish as an indicator about whether or not they're, they're contaminated with toxins. Um, but then when we eat a nice meal of shellfish that are toxic, then we get sick. The most common one that people have probably heard of is paralytic shellfish poisoning uh, or PSP and that causes the numbing of the lips and so this is not related to say if you're allergic to shellfish you can have some kind of similar re reactions but causes that the a numbness or a tingling it can cause chest pressure gastrointestinal issues and there is more than one as you can see here's at least three different genuses of concern that produce different kinds of poisons. So in Casco Bay, this is one of our hotspots for the state, which really just means that um, we frequently see these toxic species present at levels that can cause closures. Uh, the, the, the 
blooms produce toxins that we then monitor in the shellfish. And that's what we use for our closure decisions. So what we do is we monitor all th throughout Casco Bay. We, uh, we have sites that we sample phytoplankton, and then we have a team of citizen scientists that sample other stations. And we use that phytoplankton data to decide where we're going to go out and collect shellfish. Shellfish take more uh, time and cost to sample for the toxins. So phytoplankton's our nice early warning system. And we've been doing that for, say, 50 plus years. Casco Bay's been sampled routinely. And that's how we, that's how we keep the, the shellfish safe for people to eat because we're out there monitoring them. So last year, 2021, here's a, here's a graph of all of the samples we collected for mussels. Mussels are the, the primary species we collect just because they take up toxin faster than most any other species. Uh, that red line is our regulatory closure threshold. So you can see two samples approached it, but nothing ever exceeded that uh, that closure threshold. So we never had any shellfish that we considered toxic. Now at that line, no one's getting sick. You make closure levels conservative so that you've you've uh, closed it before even the most vulnerable people would be getting sick. Um, but as for context, some years we have 100 plus shellfish samples that'll be above that closure threshold. And in some years, that number is even biased because we might actually put a hold to some sampling for a set period of time, just because we know they're going to keep being over that closure threshold. So this was this was certainly a, a low toxin year, a low closure year for people who uh, harvest shellfish. So uh, why is that the case? What causes a bloom in Casco Bay? It's very complicated, and I can't really do it justice in three or four minutes. Uh, but the, there are a couple different processes that are happening. The, for one of them, Alexandrium, which is the species that causes paralytic shellfish poisoning, it's the one that we've been monitoring for the longest period of time in Maine. It's the most common cause of um, toxic shellfish and therefore the closures that we put in. Well, it, it has a complicated life cycle. And part of the year, it's a cyst, which just means it forms a hard shell and it sinks out of the water. And you can see the, the gray spots on this map, they kind of move, they, they make cyst beds. And that's where they rest in the wintertime. And then when conditions are right, they turn back into cells that swim around in the water and feed. But you can see these are kind of offshore. So uh, environmental factors that impact uh, these, these phytoplankton are actually more offshore uh, fa factors than onshore factors. Uh, and you can see that cyst beds aren't in Casco Bay themselves. So these cysts, for them to uh, form a bloom offshore and then come into Casco Bay, really, it, it has a whole host of uh, requirements. But among them, you need high light. So that's why the biotoxin season's the summertime. So starting around April or May, when you get a lot of sunlight coming, that that's one of the major triggers. That and temperature are major triggers for them to turn back into floating cells. But then beyond that, uh, you need high nutrient levels for them to feed off of. Just like if you have an aquarium, you put too much food in it, you're introducing too much nutrients, and you get that green algae uh, on the glass or that that brown filamentous algae it's the same kind of idea they have they have a requirement for high nutrients but it's even more complicated and then that you're talking about cysts that are at depth that are then moving throughout the water column to the surface so there has to be the right kind of mix and vertical mixing of those nutrients so uh, it's not something it's easy for us to to, to monitor uh, or to get that information from oceanographers and then how many cysts you have in a given year. That's the kind of, that's the a million cysts. That's the potential for a million cells that could be floating around out there. So all of those offshore variables come together to determine what kind of a bloom you get offshore. So some years we get a major bloom offshore that doesn't get into Casco Bay. Uh, and that is impacted by what are the predominant winds for the summer? Uh, what kind of storms do we have? Sometimes those storms are, well, you get a major storm or a hurricane that comes in, it'll just push these these big blooms on shore and then the currents will br bring it from more mid-coast Maine down in the Casco Bay and then once they're in the bay uh, then the local nutrients and the runoff make a difference uh, so if you get a lot of rain you're adding a lot of nutrients and 
now that you have cysts or excuse me, these floating cells in the bay, now they can really take off because of that. Uh, the, I'd say the second major species of concern is one called Pseudonychia. And this is a completely different kind of plankton uh, in that we've monitored it for a long time, but it never produced any uh, appreciable toxin in shellfish until the year 2016. And then all of a sudden we started seeing high levels of toxin, which we ended up finding out later was because of a, spe a specific species of Pseudonychia that had never been in Maine before, somehow was introduced that year and it's, it's highly toxic. And we've seen it every year in Casco Bay, but not always at high levels, but we've seen it every year. So now work is being done on that species to determine, um, they're trying to do some work to figure out where it's from, but and therefore how it could introduce, but they're also trying to figure out if we now have our own local population throughout the Gulf of Maine, including in Casco Bay, or if every year it's just getting reintroduced from Canadian uh, from currents coming from Canadian water. So this might be the fault of the Canadians. We're, we're, we're still trying to figure that part out. Um, and then to further complicate Pseudonychia, unlike Alexandrium, Alexandrium is always toxic. Well, Pseudonychia, you might have the most toxic species in the world present, but it might not be producing toxin at that time. And you can see this picture we have at, at, the, at the bottom. There are a lot of factors that are, that contribute towards whether or not it's producing toxin. And that's that's its own uh, research, uh, research branch that's being done. So even if all the environmental conditions are right, whether it's the correct currents coming in, bringing in more cells each year, or whether it's thriving cells uh, within the Gulf of Maine, if the conditions aren't right, for producing toxin, then we can be, with our phytoplankton monitoring, we're seeing the cells in the water and we're doing lots of shellfish sampling, uh, but not seeing any toxin within the shellfish. So that's that's very interesting and very different in that when we see Alexandrium, you see a lot of Alexandrium in the water, you know there's a lot of toxin in the shellfish. And Sudanich is totally different. Um, so that is a run through of the, the environmental conditions that could be caught that do contribute towards whether or not we see um, harmful algal blooms in the Casco Bay. And of course, I didn't actually tell you which ones caused it this past year, did you? Did I? Uh, but we just we know what the predominant uh, factors are. Well, I'm sure there'll be questions about that, Brian. And um, it still seems like such a mystery. I, I, I'm still just stumped as to why we saw nothing. Of course, it was great. I ate so much wonderful shellfish um, this summer, but uh, thank you very much. And while you're taking down your screen, screen share, Sarah um, Lyman, would you please put up our last poll question? Um, so be really curious to see your guesses on this one or your knowledge on this topic. Our last speaker is Matt Davis. He's a marine scientist also at the Department of Marine Resources. And Matt's research ranges from research on lobsters to tracking white sharks. And he will share an overview of sharks in Casco Bay and how the Department of Marine Resources uses tracking and an app where volunteers can report white shark sightings to monitor shifting and changing shark populations. Um, so this app, which will share information uh, about may be of interest to our water reporters and to others, um, so, Matt, would you please come on screen? Sarah, would you please share the results of our poll? Oh, um, this is a clever audience, Matt. <laughs> Get it correct? Yeah, that is perfect. I mean, that is great. Um, awesome job, everyone. I'm going to share my screen now. And I think you should all be able to see, uh, see this now. So, Wow, uh, basking sharks are indeed the biggest species we have here in the Gulf of Maine. And you wanna talk about like a really cool animal, right? It's the second largest fish in the world, uh, is completely harmless to humans. This is a filter feeding shark. Um, I mean, it's just, it's a wonderful, just gorgeous animal in my opinion. All of these fish are. Um, now here in Maine recently, we've been hearing a lot about white sharks. Um, but I just really quickly wanted to throw up this slide because I want you guys to see 
the there are more than white sharks here in Maine. We have eight normal, typical, uh, what you would consider typical species here. Um, each of them very unique and different, but um, we're gonna kind of go ahead and skip to our first slide because sometimes my enthusiasm uh, makes me talk a little longer than I should. Uh, right, so why are we hearing about white sharks all of a sudden here in New England? Well, so white sharks have been recorded in Maine back through to the 1800s. Um, however, in the 60s, 70s and 80s, they were uh, harvested quite a bit and their populations shrank. Now, in the 1990s, the federal government put in protections for white sharks so that people could no longer harvest them, uh, and this allowed their populations to recover. But almost of equal or even possibly more importance, in the 1970s, the federal government put in the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Now, this made it so that you could no longer hunt seals. Now, this is a really big deal because seals are a major prey source for white sharks. And so both the recovery of seal populations in New England and the protection of white sharks here uh, has really allowed the populations to recover to their more historical levels. However, white sharks have always been here. They've always come to these waters probably longer than we have been here. Now, let's talk about the intensive tracking in New England. So in the Northwestern Atlantic, it's kind of historically been difficult for us to track white sharks because they weren't showing up in any kind of consistency. However, in the early 2010s, people started noticing white sharks occurring fairly often off of Cape Cod down in Massachusetts. So subsequently, several organizations, including the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries, the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy, OSEARCH, several others, uh, started tagging these animals. So I wanna direct your attention to the bottom left image there. So that is a picture of Dr. Greg Scomel with the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries, and he's tagging a white shark off of Cape Cod using a javelin. Now, one of the kinds of tags they use on these sharks is called an acoustic tag. That's what you see there in the middle picture. Those acoustic tags are affixed to the shark either inside the body cavity surgically, or they can be affixed to the outside of the shark on the back of the dorsal fin, which is that, that large major fin that you see appear above water. So one of the cool things about these acoustic tags is they are used in tandem with something called an acoustic receiver. That's the image you see there on the bottom right. To give you an idea of how this works, you have a several species or animals with one of these tags on them. And then we deploy these receivers into the water. And anytime one of those acoustic tags comes within a couple hundred meters of a receiver, it sends a timestamp ping so that, you know, if a shark that has a tag goes near one of these receivers, it's recorded. And then when you retrieve that receiver at the end of the year and you download all the data, you can see what tags have been near the receiver and when they were nearby. Now it is really important, and I can't stress this enough, it is so important to recognize that if a shark or another fish does not have one of these acoustic tags implanted, it is not going to be recorded on the receiver. The receiver is only gonna pick up an animal with an active tag on it. So this here is an image of our array this past year. We had 31 receivers out. The ones in pink are still out right now. I'm actually, <laughs> I was hoping to get them in before now uh, to avoid winter weather, but we're going to be getting those in soon. So the data from those pink receivers, we have not gotten yet because we have to physically be holding these receivers in order to download the data. So some of that data remains outstanding. But the DMR, while we haven't tagged any sharks, we have been recording uh, detections on these acoustic receivers. In 2020, we had 12 receivers. Uh, in 2021, this past year, we've had 31 receivers we deployed, uh, as well as creating a shark sightings form, which we're gonna talk about. And then this next year, we'll be doing uh, both the receiver and the sighting form as well. But in addition, we're going to uh, be deploying something called a live receiver, which, which I'm like super excited about. You deploy these off of, um, off of the beach, similar to your regular acoustic receiver, except any time a tag is pinged or picked up by that receiver, it actually sends an alert in real time to uh, someone at the DMR as well as beach officials. So this will be much more useful in regards to public safety if a shark is detected near the beach. So what have we learned so far? 
So including our receiver that we put out uh, at the end of August in 2020, and then the receivers from this last year, we've detected a total of 38 individual white sharks so far. Again, only sharks with tags are picked up. So there could be more white sharks that just haven't been tagged or white sharks that aren't swimming near these receivers. But we know of 38. Um, they don't typically tend to spend much time in one area before they move on. Um, we've picked up a wide range of sizes from four feet long all the way up to, you know, about 15 feet long, which is a fully mature shark. Um, in 2001, uh, sorry, 2021, uh, July and August were our months where we had the most shark detections. And then when we're thinking about what areas, you know, have the most individual sharks detected, uh, Hermit Island so far has had the most number of sharks detected. Hermit Island is circled on this image um, that you see here in the top right by the red circle, that's Hermit Island, just to the west of Popham Beach. And that had 18 individuals. Now to give you an idea, um, the second highest number was seven and that was at Scarborough Beach. Um, about half of our receivers, so somewhere around 15 or so, only detected one shark. So don't think that there are a ton of sharks showing up at each receiver. So what if you yourself are in the water and you're enjoying a day of recreation? Uh, how do you identify a white shark? Um, the most common species that is confused with white sharks are basking sharks, those big filter feeding harmless creatures. Um, and so let's just talk really quickly about the differences. So if you see a dorsal fin on the top that has a very straight edge and a very pointy tip to the dorsal fin, that would be a white shark, whereas your basking shark below has a much more rounded dorsal fin. Concerning body shape, white sharks are a little bit more uh, conical, a little more like a torpedo, whereas your basking shark has a much broader head at its base. Now, as far as coloration goes, white sharks are pretty dark gray on the top, but they have a very distinct white underbelly, whereas basking sharks are more of a uniform color throughout, more gray, um, and they often have some speckles on them, whereas white sharks typically do not. So what do you do if you see a shark, right? Uh, first thing I would say is get out of the water. Um, and alert the nearest beach official if there is one nearby. Now, you can report sightings to the main Department of Marine Resources. If you can get a picture of these animals, that really helps us in identifying uh, what it is you saw. So what you'll do is you'll just open your, you know, your internet search engine, and if you type in main DMR shark or DMR main shark or, you know, some mix of those three words, um, usually our shark page is going to be the first link you come across. And when you click on that, it's going to bring you to the white shark research page. And I've copied an image of that in here. And then you're going to go down to where I have this red box and you're going to click the form link. Once you've submitted a form, this is what it's going to look like. Um, you can fill out information surrounding the animal, what you saw in images. That's going to send an alert to us. And then we can review you know, your sightings report to determine what it is that you saw. Um, and we will send back an email or a text or something that you know, confirming what you saw or asking for more questions. And eventually, uh, these will be passed on to one of our collaborators, the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy, um, who runs a, pub a public phone app known as Sharktivity, which is <laughs> just like a super cool app because it displays all white shark sightings within the New England region. And so everything ends up in one place in Sharktivity. The last thing I wanna to touch on, because um, I know I'm probably a little over time, is just how you can minimize your chances of an encounter, right? Don't swim alone, stay close to shore or near health if possible, avoid swimming at dawn and dusk, don't swim near people fishing, Possibly the most important one is to avoid swimming near schools of fish or seals, right? You don't want to be swimming next to these things, uh, prey items. The water here in Maine is turbid. That means it's, you know, it's very cloudy. Sharks have really good eyesight, but cloudy water can make it difficult for them to identify prey species and they might make an accident. Avoid wearing shiny jewelry that looks like scales. Uh, and just be careful near steep drop-offs and sandbars because sharks often use this kind of area or geography uh, during their hunting. 
And with that, thank you so much uh, for listening. I appreciate all of you and all of our collaborators. And uh, yeah, okay, I'm done. I'll stop talking. Thanks so much, Matt. Um, would you please uh, stop your screen share? And I want to invite all of our panelists um, to come back on. And to our guests, uh, the presentations um, all so interesting and so informative. We have a shorter time for questions, so I'm going to turn it right over to Mike so he can delve right in. Sure, thank you. These are fantastic. And we do only have a few minutes. And I, um, before I begin with questions, uh, do, do we have the email or contact information for the pres presenters? In case there are questions we don't get to that our, our audience has, they can reach them by email. Uh, but jumping right in, um, for Marissa, I guess, uh, are green crabs also impacting the blue mussel population? Or for anyone? So, yeah, the green crabs are a voracious predator of really any bivalve shellfish. So um, yeah, absolutely. And you can commonly see evidence of that where you see fewer mussels along the shoreline where they're easy to get um, by the green crab. And then oftentimes you see a lot of mussels in places like underneath floating docks or on mooring lines where it's harder for the green crabs to access them. Right, sure. And I'll kind of rapid fire these just to get through as many as we can. But uh, for Sarah, um, what are the other predators of soft shell clams? Um, yeah, green crabs, milky ribbon worms are a big one in um, Casco Bay, um, docks, fish, um, they, they'll all eat them. But I think the tipping point is the um, invasive green crab and their population explosion with the warming waters. Great, thank you. Um, and back to Marissa real quick. Um, after counting the green crabs, what do you do with them? Do they go home with you or back in the water? Good question. At our long-term monitoring sites, we actually don't remove the green crabs because in order to not bias our population estimates, we really need to make sure that we're not you know, impacting densities by removing them. Um, and I will also say that at the scale that we're doing this, uh, there is really very little and most likely no impact that we would have by removing the amounts of green crabs that we're sampling on the shoreline. Uh, it would take massive, massive, massive amounts of removal effort in order to actually reduce the population. Right. But I guess as a quick follow up, are there things in place? Are there any way we can get rid of the green crab population? Are there products in place or ways we're thinking of to get them? Yeah. Um, so we actually are focused a lot on fishery and market development. And it's unclear if, if that, I mean, we're trying to create incentives for people to go out and, and harvest green crabs, but it's really more focused on the opportunity that can be gained from the species. It's unclear if that type of effort is actually going to impact the population overall, um, but we think that there's a huge amount of opportunity for fishers and coastal communities and culinary markets to actually benefit from the species. Great. Uh, for Bryant then, um, have we seen PSP or ASP um, higher up the food chain um, with eider ducks eating mussels, for example, does, does the turn up there? So for ASP, amnesic shellfish poisoning that produced by Pseudonychia, that is no, that's uh, well known across the world to go up the trophic uh, levels. So that's something that um, the, the thing people always say is that the movie The Birds by Alfred Hitchcock right. was based off of a West Coast uh, amnesic shellfish poisoning event where the birds were eating the fish that were eating, you know, it working its way backwards and they were getting sick. Um, yeah. And then they were behaving very strange. So it, it definitely does happen. It's common in the amnesic shellfish poisoning. It can get right up to things like seals and whales. It can work its way very oh. high up. Uh, seals are common in the West Coast to be impacted by it. But we have not seen that yet um, in, in Maine. Okay. So we haven't had the same scale of blooms like they've had on in California, where unfortunately they've had to deal with major ASP uh, events in the past that have worked this way up. We do watch for it, and we have sampled um, some of the lower trophic animals, so cr cr uh, different kinds of crabs and lobsters and urchins, and we have seen trace amounts in them. So we do know some amount is moving up, but it, I mean, it's trace levels. Okay. And we've had main CDC do uh, food analysis with the lobsters in particular, such a such hot item. Um, and it's shown that it's just, it's not um, a public health concern. 
Great. Okay. Good. And for Matt, there's a couple here for you, of course. Um, has you seen a, a, a general seasonality in the uh, shark abundance in the sightings on the coast of Maine? Yeah. So in short, um, white sharks have a, a pretty wide thermal preference. So they can they can be seen as low as just about zero degrees Celsius or just just above freezing point. But typically, you're going to start to see these sharks um, once the water hits about 55 degrees Fahrenheit. That's when they really start uh, becoming more common. As far as we can tell here in Maine, um, we will start seeing their numbers ramp up in about June. Uh, July is when they really start to take off. And then August and September and October, you know, it, it's August is high. It starts to slowly go down. Um, we have detected them as late as November, but so far as our receiver array has gone, we haven't seen any in December yet. Okay, good. <laughs> and I guess one quick one, uh, one more for you, Matt. Um, what shark species in Maine is most abundant? Wow, that's a tough one. You know, it's probably going to be your spiny dogfish. Um, small, three foot long, um, harmless to humans. We also have a lot of blue sharks, depending on where you are in the state. Um, really to ask that question, it depends on just where within the water column you are, but uh, it is probably not going to be a white shark. Okay, good, good to know. And I guess one last quick follow-up to that, um, as far as where in the, uh, the water column, do you ever see basking sharks up uh, near the surface, near uh, ledges, near shore? You do. So um, our sightings report last year, we got quite a few uh, kickbacks from people and uh, quite often we would see basking sharks, um, you know, you're thinking like Harpswell, Bailey's Island area, they do like to cruise very slowly at the surface. So, so that's actually really great. I'm glad you asked this question. Um, if you see a shark and it is very slowly just kind of gliding along, cruising through the water, that is probably going to be a basking shark, particularly if it's for several minutes at a time, because they're usually at the surface filter feeding, whereas white sharks, while they do spend time at the surface, um, unless they're like on a really long uh, transient migration, they typically aren't gonna just be hanging out at the surface for an extended period of time. Great. Well, thanks all of you. I'm um, glad we got through that without much I was much, just going to uh, say, Mike, you, uh, we probably have time for one more question. Or are you all sure. set to get through? Just do one more really quickly, well, and then I'll one, close up. Um, there's, a, there's just such a great list here. Um, I, I, one more for Brian, because I was wondering as well. Um, when we had the Karenia bloom early on, a couple, three years ago now, um, there was talk about a cyst bed being formed from that off Portland Harbor. Is there any? Uh, more word about that? Did a cyst bed occur? No, that that species is capable of making cysts, so it's feasible. But no one's uh, DMR doesn't do that kind of research, and I have not heard about anyone doing that kind of research. It would definitely be worthwhile to do, and we do still see the cells in Casco Bay every single year, not like they were back in I think it was 2017, right. where the Four River kind of turned into dark tea colored and stink. Yeah. But it was visible. Yeah, it was very visible. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, so oh. go ahead, Mike, do you have something you want to? No, this has been wonderful. Okay. Um, so I want to be cognizant of time. Thank yeah. uh, all of our amazing presenters and guests for joining us today. We will send a follow up email with a recording of this program. We did capture all of your questions in chat. And we can send some follow-up links or contact information um, to our speakers if people want to follow up and get more information. We will certainly share Sarah's information because we are just as eager as you are to know the results of the, the studies this past summer. Um, on the horizon, we will have a Casco Bay Matters event coming up on the offshore wind roadmap process and the environmental wildlife recommendations regarding that. So stay tuned. And we're also planning some events to celebrate Clean Water Act 50, among other events. So stay tuned for more programming in 2022. I want to thank everyone for joining us, for loving Casco Bay, and for doing all you do to help us protect this resource. Again, a special thank you to our panelists and to yes. my colleagues behind the scene who don't like to be called out, but without Sarah Lyman and Robbie Lewis Nash, we could not make this go as smoothly as possible. So special thank you to them behind the scenes. 
Bye, everyone. Thank you.